Hello, saints, peace, love, and grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you. I hope everybody's having a fantastic day today. We continue on in our study in the book of Galatians, one of Paul's first books, if not the first book that he wrote. We left off in chapter 1. Paul is writing about his experience on the road to Damascus, his journey to Arabia, then back to Damascus and over to Jerusalem. Then we see Paul go north to a city called Tarsus, preaching the gospel of grace to the Gentiles for over 10 years. In Tarsus, we know this is where Paul was born and he became a Roman citizen. So now we're at chapter 2 in the book of Galatians and we need to get started quickly because there's a lot of information concerning this particular chapter. Uh, on a side note, towards the end of our study, there's going to be a small video clip that I want to share with everybody. A video that demonstrates exactly what happens when we don't rightly divide scripture. Beginning our study, Galatians 2 in the King James Version Bible, always in verse 1. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. Now, when we left off in our last study in chapter 1, Paul was writing his testimony about how he came to know Jesus Christ as Lord on his way to Damascus. Then Paul went to Arabia. We know he went back to Damascus, then over to Jerusalem. Then Paul would go back to his birthplace, the city of Tarsus, Roman Gentile territory, where he'd stay for over 10 years, preaching the gospel of grace to the Gentiles. Then Barnabas would come and get Paul. Then they headed down to Antioch and eventually back to the region of Judea, Paul estimates that 14 years have passed since his first visit with Peter in Jerusalem. In verse 2, And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. In Galatians 2.2, it's very important to get this verse, and if if you're a type of person that memorizes verses, this is one that you should add to your list. Now, why do I say that? The reason why Galatians 2.2 is so important is because it shows us the timeline of Paul's gospel. Paul tells us exactly what he was doing in Tarsus for over 10 years. It shows us exactly what gospel Paul was preaching right from the beginning of his conversion. And we saw in our study on the book of Acts, when Ananias went to Damascus to talk with Paul, Jesus revealed to Ananias that Paul would be sent to the Gentiles. Paul wasn't part of Peter and the other 11 apostles. Paul was a new type of apostle. He was the first kind, uh, the first of his kind, and he was the firstborn in the body of Christ. Galatians 2.2 Paul says clearly that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Now, I need to warn you, there is a false teaching out there. Well, there are many false teachings, but there is one in particular that teaches that Paul only went to the Gentiles during the end of his ministry, somewhere around Acts chapter 28. Now, this would be after he wrote Galatians and Thessalonians and Corinthians and Romans uh, while writing the four prison epistles, Philemon, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, this teaching has a name for it, and it's called Acts 28 Hybrid Theology. Now, Brother Sean Brasso has done a very detailed study exposing this teaching, and I highly recommend you take the time to watch his study before this false teaching comes your way. And it will come your way, trust me. The enemy is hard at work to confuse anyone whose eyes have been opened to right division. The enemy's goal is to stop the truth from spreading any further. Now, the name of this video from Sean Brasso is called A Refutation of Acts 928 Hybrid Theology, and there are several parts to this study. The link is on the screen. So, please take the time to watch Brother Sean's study Put on that armor before this poison comes your way. All right. Galatians 2 verse 3. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, which is Gentile, 
was compelled to be circumcised. Now, the Jews wanted to circumcise Titus, who was a Gentile believer. So this tells us the uh, situation here is probably happening just prior to the Jerusalem Council. And we know that the Jerusalem Council was all about the Jews trying to impose their traditions and laws on the Gentiles, which circumcision was one of those laws that they wanted to impose. Galatians 2.4 and that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage to whom we gave place by subjection no not for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you but of these who seem to be somewhat whatsoever they were it maketh no matter to me God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Our liberty in Christ Jesus can be summed up in one simple phrase. Faith alone without works. Believing on Christ Jesus, who he is, and what he did for us on the cross. Faith alone without works. That's our liberty in Christ Jesus. Verse 7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter, speaking of the Holy Spirit here, to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Now, before we move on, let's refresh our memories concerning Barnabas. Who is Barnabas? And why was he chosen to travel with Paul? We learned in our study on the book of Acts that Barnabas was a believer in the kingdom program. Okay, Barnabas is Jewish. Also, Barnabas was from the island of Cyprus. In fact, he was very well known and had a good rapport with the people of Cyprus. And Barnabas would be instrumental in opening doors for Paul. He gave Paul the credibility needed so people would listen to Paul's gospel of grace. So, Barnabas was a believer in the kingdom gospel prior to Paul's conversion in other words, Barnabas was part of the little flock of sheep of the house of Israel. And Paul was not part of that little flock of sheep. Paul was the first apostle in and first born in the body of Christ, the mystery program. And we saw in our last study on Galatians chapter 1 that Paul was removed from his mother's womb, Jerusalem. And God put Paul into the body of Christ. We saw it in Galatians 1 verse 15. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. In Galatians 4 verse 26 we find out who this mother is. It's not his physical mother. He's speaking as somebody else. Galatians 4 verse 26. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. So Paul's mother is Jerusalem. That who, that's his spiritual mother, okay? God took Paul out of Jerusalem's program, Israel's program, uh, the Mosaic Law program, took Paul out of that system and placed Paul into a brand new system we know as the body of Christ, the mystery gospel of grace. Paul is the first apostle, the only type of that apostle in his program. Now, continuing on, verse 10, only they would that we should remember the poor, the same 
which I also was forward to do. If you recall the Jerusalem Council meeting, part of the agreement they reached was that the Gentiles would continue to support the needy, whether they were Jewish or Gentiles, it didn't matter. In Galatians 2.11, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he, Peter, did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, Peter, he, withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Now, we read in our study in Acts chapter 10, Peter sees a vision. The vision is a huge sheet-like figure filled with both clean and unclean animals. And our Lord God tells Peter to rise and eat. But Peter, being a devout Jew, refused to accept the idea concerning eating any of the unclean animals. Eating unclean animals, as you uh, see in the book of uh, Leviticus, was against the Mosaic laws. Under the Levitical laws, certain animals were clean and some were unclean, never to be eaten or even touched. Just touching an unclean animal would require the Jews to go through a process of cleansing rituals. They took these laws very, very seriously. So you can imagine that Peter was uncertain concerning the meaning of the vision until he's brought to a Roman soldier, a Gentile by the name of Cornelius. It's also important to know that Cornelius was a devout believer in the kingdom gospel. Cornelius prayed and worshipped God the very same way the Jews did. He gave much alms to the temple. He helped the poor. He performed works just like the Jews at the time. Cornelius practiced the very same temple sacrifices and works based religion. Peter was taken to Cornelius, this Gentile, and once Peter saw the Holy Spirit coming upon those Gentiles, that's when Peter understood the vision that he had of the both clean and unclean animals. Peter now came to realize that salvation was not just to and for the, the Jews, but now even the Gentiles could be justified in Christ Jesus. Cornelius and the other Gentiles would have been considered proselytes in the kingdom program. So Peter knew that God was now delivering the Gentiles along with the Jews. And here in verse 11 and 12, we see Peter eating with the Gentiles, which was considered an abomination under the Mosaic system of laws. Peter knew in his heart that it was now acceptable to eat with the heathen, the Gentiles. However, because of the law-mindedness of the Jews, their traditions, and the peer pressure of the Mosaic system still in full force during the transition, when Peter was around the kingdom saints, the Jews, he stopped hanging around with the Gentiles, acting as if they were still unclean and so on. Peter was being a hypocrite, and Paul calls him out on that. Paul exposes Peter's hypocrisy, and we see in the next verse that not only Peter, but other Jewish believers were also doing the very same thing. They were under peer pressure from other Mosaic law-minded Jews being in their presence. In verse 13, And the other Jews disassembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Now here's confirmation of what I mentioned earlier concerning Barnabas. He was very much a Jew in the kingdom program, even separating himself from the Gentiles, just like Peter did. In verse 14, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Paul exposes Peter's hypocrisy before everyone. So you can imagine that this probably was a very uncomfortable experience for Peter. But Paul needed to do it to prove a point, that God no longer considered the Gentiles inferior to the Jews, and things were changing. There was a transition. Remember, this was pretty early on in that transitional process. 
from the dispensation of the Mosaic system, the kingdom, over to the dispensation of grace. In verse 15, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, hear that, faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now, we need to take a closer look at verse 16. There's a lot going on in there. I'm about to show you why it's impossible for anyone to lose salvation. And also, I'm about to reveal to you the enemy's tactics being used to cause some people out there to think that they can lose their salvation. The devil is in the details here, literally. In order to understand what's going on here in verse 16, we need to compare scripture between the King James Version Bible and the new versions out there confusing people. Now, let's look at verse 15 and 16 in the King James Version Bible. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now let's take a look at a corrupted version, the NIV. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, they changed of Jesus Christ to in Jesus Christ, and that is very significant. So we too have put our faith in in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Now, let's look at the New King James Version, starting at verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith again in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Now notice the King James Version Bible tells us it's the faith of Jesus Christ. It's his faith that's the subject here, okay? It's his faith, not ours. The new versions take away his faith and they make it our faith as the subject. All right, that's a pretty slick move if you ask me. The simple difference between the King James Version and a new version boils down to these two things. The King James Version teaches faith alone for salvation and the corrupted versions all teach faith plus works to keep salvation. 99.9% .9 of the time when you meet someone who's convinced that salvation comes by faith plus works, you'll also discover that they've been studying from a new version of the Bible. And you can't blame them for believing a lie because they're believing exactly what they're reading. The new versions teach faith plus works all throughout Paul's epistles. How do they do it? Simply by changing the word of to in. Two things with this verse. First, they remove the fact that Jesus fulfilled the law to completion by his faithfulness. It's not our faith, but his faith that's important there. Second, notice how the New King James Version makes no sense. It's not grammatically correct. They point to our faith in Christ twice in the same sentence. It doesn't make sense. Again, it's the faith of Jesus Christ. It's his faithfulness to fulfill the law completely to remove us from the power of the law. Jesus is the one who had to fulfill the law, not us. 2 Timothy 2, verse 11, we read, It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. But listen to this. If we believe not, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful 
he cannot deny himself. Very important. There are dozens of other verses where they change the subject from Jesus to us. They change his faithfulness over to our faith. Instead of his faith, they make it our faith to keep salvation. Another example, real quick, 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. The new version, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, okay, that's a works-based, it is the power of God, saved and being saved. Again, they make it look like salvation is a process of good works. It's a total lie. And really, the, the New King James Version Bible is exactly what the major religions are teaching today. Without the knowledge of right division, you're easily deceived into a works-based salvation, traditions of men, denominational organizations, and so on. There are many, many other examples of how the counterfeit versions change the gospel. In fact, I've made two videos all about these changes. If you want to study this out more, uh, the two videos, I'm going to put them on the screen. First one is their plan caught red-handed. The second one, shocking discovery exposed. Also, in those two videos, I share another video link with you that actually reveals the plans of the enemy, what he's doing what, it, what the process is right now, today, in this current world, what he's using to deceive the masses prior to the second coming. It's extremely eye-opening, and I highly suggest you arm yourself with the information I provide for you in those two studies. Continuing on, Galatians 2.17, But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is there ver therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Now in verse 20, we have another situation very similar to verse 16. The counterfeit versions change this verse as well. Look at the King James Version again, 220. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The new version, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I live by faith of the Son of God is correct, not in the Son of God. It's Jesus who was faithful to die on the cross, be buried, and rise again. Our Lord Jesus believed and had faith that one day he would be crucified, be buried, and rise again from the grave. He had faith that in doing these things, he would pay for all mankind's sins. And in order to claim that promise, we have to have the same faith in the same thing that our Lord Jesus had before these things happened to him. Can you see how the new versions remove the faith of our Lord Jesus? How they change it. Now, in a moment, I'm going to show you a short clip of a video that I found, which explains in great detail how not rightly dividing God's word is causing all kinds of confusion. But before I show you that little clip, We've seen uh, two things on our study in Galatians 2. We're seeing Paul address the difference between law versus grace. He's making for us a clear distinction between the kingdom gospel for Peter's little flock and the grace gospel for the body of Christ. Paul is teaching us the difference between dispensations, outlining for us this transition taking place during his 30-plus year ministry. 
And second, we went into more complex uh, details on our security in Christ Jesus. The salvation we have in Christ cannot be lost ever. Why can't it be lost? Because in the first place, we're not the ones keeping it. We have no control over keeping our salvation. We couldn't keep our salvation even if we tried because our faith wavers from day to day. We're still in the form of corrupted flesh susceptible to our sinful lusts. Our faith isn't perfect. So our security and completeness in salvation depends solely on the faith of Christ Jesus. It's his faith. His faith cannot waver, does not change from day to day, and cannot be lost. It's his faith that keeps us sealed by his Holy Spirit for eternity. Once you completely understand that you cannot work to maintain your salvation, then you'll depend on Christ Jesus to keep you saved. Then you'll realize that your salvation is eternal and can never be lost. I want you to think about that. Now, it's also important to understand that this eternal seal of salvation only applies in this dispensation of grace, the body of Christ. In the kingdom program, where works are once again a factor on maintaining their fruit or keeping the oil enduring till the end, they can lose their justification in Christ Jesus. Our Lord Jesus gives the kingdom saints example after example through various parables how they can end up being a goat versus a sheep. How some of them will be the virgins without enough oil to enter into the kingdom and so on. There is a difference between salvation and justification as well, which we'll get into in a future study. We, the body of Christ, are saved in Christ Jesus. The kingdom saints are justified in Christ Jesus. One is eternal, the other is based on endurance and works. What happens is, people who don't rightly divide God's word put themselves in scripture that's not meant for us, the body of Christ today. They put themselves in scripture meant for the kingdom saints during Daniel's 70th week. Then they get all confused and they think they can lose their salvation. Now, here's that small clip of the video that I mentioned earlier showing this exact situation of not rightly dividing using scripture that's not meant for us today. Absolutely no understanding of dispensations, placing themselves outside of the body of Christ. The same situation Paul dealt with all throughout his 30 plus year ministry. Now let's take a look at this real quick. Pray, okay? It has nothing to do with if you sin after you've been saved. Everybody's going to sin. Well, well listen, you, know? you, you sound like you've fallen away. And that's why you're saying these things. No. Look, the Bible says this, Hebrews 10, he says, if we sin willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there's no longer a sacrifice for sin. Okay? That's Hebrews. So, so you're saying you can lose your salvation if you believe? That's what the Bible says. No. Hebrews 10, 26. Good night, guys. Look it up. Okay, so first of all, this man uses the phrase falling away completely out of context. All right? The falling away is the apostasia that we read about in 2 Thessalonians 2. Paul was speaking to those people in Daniel 70th week that will fall away, that choose to leave their faith in God for the delusion that God is going to create during that time. We covered this in detail in our study in the book of Acts. Also in that clip, we saw a person using Hebrews as a reference. When the book of Hebrews is written to the Hebrews who will be going through Daniel 70th week. It's their scripture that will help them through those seven years enduring till the end. He's quoting scripture outside of Paul's 13 books that's meant for us. And he's using scriptures not written for us to deceive people into thinking they can lose their salvation if they don't continue to perform good works. This person has placed himself back under the kingdom gospel. He's, he's in the wrong dispensation. And without a doubt, he's going to be going into Daniel's 70th week because his idea of salvation is based on his works and not the finished work of the cross. And this is happening all over the world today. So you can see why it's so very important to understand right division and how dispensations apply throughout God's word. The King, the King James Version Bible 
was organized according to dispensations. Those of you who've had the eye, your eyes opened understand that. Looking at the New Testament, first we see the four, the four Gospels, the Mosaic system, then Jesus establishes the kingdom program to usher in the promised earthly kingdom for Israel. Well, Israel rejects Jesus, their kingdom promise is postponed, then we see a transition from the kingdom over to the mystery revealed to Paul. Then once the rapture happens, the mystery, Paul's gospel of grace, the body of Christ, comes to a close. Then we see the continuation of the promised covenant for Israel, picking back up where they left off with the stoning of Stephen. Also, if you notice, even Paul's books are organized dispensationally according to the transition from kingdom to mystery, the building of the body of Christ. Paul's books start very early on in the transitional process, then progresses to the completed transition over to the body of Christ. Where Paul is no longer completely absorbed by the kingdom saints, he concentrates on the specifics of the mystery, the gospel for us today. But even still, today, there's many, many people out there under the deception of denominational teaching that have no clue what right division is. And they're being told lies that, you know, they're, they're being told that dispensation is something that's just made up out of thin air. Notice, it's the same tactic they use against the harpazo, the rapture. They say it's just an idea that was just made up recently. Even when Paul uses the word dispensation four times in his books, to explain the difference of God's administrations and the difference between the kingdom gospel and the gospel of grace. Those of you who've been gifted with the ability to see and understand right division have a responsibility. You shouldn't keep this amazing understanding to yourself. You need to be a voice on the mountaintop. You need to be a reflection of our Lord's righteousness upon the earth while we still have time. I understand that, you know, each of us have certain functions within the body of Christ. Not all of us can make videos. Not all of us can preach in front of people. I understand that. That's why there's other tools available like booklets and pamphlets and Bible tracks. You know, everyone can leave a booklet or a Bible track on a gas pump. That's something all of us can do. Here's some addresses. I'm going to put some addresses on, on the screen for you that you can copy and you can buy Bible tracts that are designed correctly according to right division using the King James Version Bible as well. Okay. And I mean, it's very important. Very, very important. The enemy is working hard to keep people under the bondage of law and works, stealing their joy and security in Christ Jesus. We need to work just as hard to lead people to the truth of God's word and hopefully to salvation in Christ Jesus saving them from the wrath to come. Amen? So, peace, grace, and love of Christ Jesus be with all of you saints. Lord willing, I'll see you on the next study in Galatians chapter 3.